I will not reply uh, individually to uh, to your chat, but uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas Stewart. I'm strategy director at Complete College America, and welcome to our initial offering of the 2021 series uh, of the or 2021 edition of CCA Live. Um, as you may know, since you registered, you uh, CCA is offering webinars. Uh, on a regular basis, we're basically going to offer them every two weeks on Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, make sure you go to uh, the same website that you uh, saw the, uh, the original link to register. Uh, you'll be able to see the different offerings, the different strategies that we will be discussing with the different webinars. Right now, they are uh, scheduled until, uh, right now, I think we have them until August, but they probably will be uh, until October, so every two weeks. And also would be, um, I'm gonna invite you to look at our, and listen rather, to our new podcast. So uh, piece one of them is uh, live now, it's called CCA on the Air. Uh, and you have the, uh, the link here to uh, look at it uh, and to listen to them. We have different um, platforms where you can listen to uh, you know, your favorite podcasts. Hopefully ours will become one of your favorites as well. So where uh, we'll be discussing different issues around student success uh, and uh, college completion. So I strongly encourage you to, um, to check it out. Uh, the same also to create a profile on our website. Uh, again, it's free. You're going to have an opportunity to really connect and network with uh, uh, colleagues in, uh, in your region, your state, uh, in different roles, in you know, similar institutions, so on and so forth, as well as get our um, our newsletter and different news and different resources that um, will be coming you know, that will be coming out shortly. Uh, we're also in the process of revamping our website a little bit more, so you're going to have a little bit more information around our strategies and pillars and uh, policies and everything else that we're working on right now. So uh, today, glad that you guys can uh, join us to talk about academic maps. And uh, joining me is. Uh, I'll claim Larry as uh, C as ours. Uh, he's a CCA fellow, but uh, let me just uh, briefly introduce Larry, uh, very distinguished. Uh, his experience includes nine years as the department chair, three years as dean of arts and sciences, and 16 years as provost at uh, Florida State University. Since 1994, he has directed and continues to direct the Institute for Academic Leadership, providing training for department chairs across the system university system, the state university system of Florida, pardon me. He was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences in 1986, received a Pace Setter Award in 2009, honoring those who have made a significant contribution to student advising, and was awarded the Stan Jones Legacy Award in 2019 by CCA for his commitment to the college completion movement. While Provost, he focused on improving retention and graduation rates and reached the conclusions that graduation rates can be increased with strong commitment, data-driven actions, and focused attention to details, that there's not a single action for success, but rather a series of different actions that can be sustained and should be sustained over a long period of time. Uh, some of this uh, low-cost successful action that uh, Larry became known for include, obviously, uh, academic maps, which we'll talk about today, uh, as well as having advisors carefully record all interactions with students along with every questions asked, something that uh, we can also address, which is very much relevant as well with maps and uh, purpose. Building a series of action steps for students that are aligned with the academic calendar and creating freshman interest groups or you know, learning communities uh, to support that. Uh, some other actions that might, be, might come a little bit uh, higher costs in some cases uh, includes re-engineering higher enrollment, high enrollment, low success courses, adding a successful learning strategy course, adding tutors, and uh, adding advisors and coaches as well. At his own institution, he worked for years on improving graduation rates with uh, a lot of success, I would say, where he increased the graduation rate of a uh, four-year graduation rate by 20%, and uh, his six-year, the six-year graduation rate by over 16%. And with that, even by uh, significantly reducing the graduation gaps. In addition to his work at Complete College America, Larry has worked with administration, faculty, and advisors at over 25 campus, campuses were, uh, nationwide, 
to help create, update, and optimize Accident Maps. So with that, thank you, Larry, for joining me today. Um, you see this? Uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, quick. Uh, it's our first. I apologize for this. Uh, so again, you guys will be muted uh, during the duration of the webinar. Uh, so if you do have questions, please uh, list them in the Q&A or in the chat. We'll be happy to uh, answer the questions for you. And uh, again, please feel free to use the Q&A throughout the duration of the webinar. So with that, Larry, uh, I'd like to start us off, uh, if you don't mind, with just, I guess, the, the basic question, uh, why maps? You know, uh, what, what are the advantages of uh, having comprehensive degree plans for our students and for the institutions? Oh, and you're muted right now. There, there we go. <laughs> uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, I hope this is both uh, informative and valuable. Academic maps um, occurred to me very slowly, actually. I, um, when I attended Miami-Dade Community College, uh, I'd never opened a college catalog and had a really hard time figuring out what to take. Then my first position was at a small campus uh, where there weren't many faculty. And so I was, as an arts and sciences person, I almost had to advise everyone in arts and sciences. And I uh, opened the catalog and tried to figure out, you know, what I could tell students, what I could advise them on. I found it um, quite confusing, especially uh, general education. And then I became a faculty member. I left that institution and joined Florida State University. And at that time, faculty did all of the advising. And um, I thought it would be a lot easier because I knew the major and I knew the courses. And that turned out um, not entirely to be the case, partly because of the huge number of general education options. There were over 300 choices. I don't know how you can call it general education when you've got so many choices. And I've seen that um, on campus after campus. And I had a team of fabulous people, academic advisors, admissions, uh, registration, financial aid, that we met on a regular basis to discuss student status and decided that one thing that would help everyone is an absolute clear path to graduation. And it would help everyone in a lot of ways. Uh, the student and the, fa and the uh, advisor, whether it's a faculty or professional advisor, could look at that, they, they didn't have to talk about what courses I need, they could talk about other issues. If they wanted to change majors, they could compare other maps, you know, what's in common, what's not, how many courses, what I might lose under this. Um, it, it was just a real eye opener too, because I had, I, I tried as a provost never to ask faculty members to do anything that we couldn't do centrally and then give it to them for their approval and guidance. So we started building these academic maps and found all kinds of inconsistencies in the catalog. Um, required courses that had gone away five, six years before. And I was introduced to something I'd never even heard of before, hidden prerequisites. So faculty had decided, even though the course wasn't listed as a major requirement, when you went to that course, oh no, you have to have this other course first, which added, um, made the degree longer. And especially when the legislature mandated that we had to have all degrees at 120 hours, it became impossible with hidden prerequisites so they had to be addressed. That time we didn't really talk much about uh, mathematics. Uh, we had this assumption that everyone should take college algebra. And pretty much, uh, I think that first year, we had to have almost 6,000 seats in college algebra to handle all the incoming students, transfer students who didn't have it, and students who had skipped it early on. Now, there's a lot of very positive discussions about the right pathway. And by building the academic maps, you're required to address that question. The uh, I don't know if you want to let questions come in as we go. I'm happy to answer them. 
or um, I can go through some of the things that I sent you earlier, Nicholas. Uh, what's your pleasure? Yep. Well, let's let's start let's start with uh, with some of the things that you sent me. I think that that's relevant. And then, by the way, uh, you mentioned hidden prerequisites just before uh, today. I, I was just looking at different websites to find like what are good you know good examples of maps. And one of the, the the one I looked at had actually in the comments like pre, you know prerequisites check catalog uh, in there. And, and exactly it was like exactly to your point. It's like unfortunately it's still there. This, this is not like you know. Uh, abstract. Uh, if if you do different searches on the website, you're going to find exactly what you're talking about. So I was wondering if you talk about uh, the the good academic maps. Like, what are the components of a good academic map? Because again, uh, every time I talk to uh, folks at different institutions, the first thing they say is, "Well, we do have maps. You know, they're they're somewhere in the catalog that nobody reads because they don't know what it is." Uh, but what, what are the a good academic maps? What, what should a good academic map have? Well, the, um, I had the huge advantage of um, this team of people who worked with students. I would have academic advisors, departmental academic advisors, and we had gone to um, sort of floating academic advisors as well. So. Uh, the funny thing is I put some in the food court and in the gym. <laughs> Those were total losses. I mean, no, nobody ever stopped by. However, in the library and the student union, the big classroom building. So they, they had a lot of comments about our first um, drafts of these maps that we shared with students and advisors. So they, they had recommended really five things that we include. One, it sounds obvious but a narrative how do you read the damn thing you know and what does a milestone mean so um we wanted to give everybody how to read it a sample schedule and we had a lot of debates over should the schedule end up with 12 or 15 hours and you heard all of this the faculty we got pushed back immediately from everybody at 15 hours all of our students work Oh, they're not strong enough. And I'm a huge proponent of testable hypotheses. And both of those are testable. So you can build a database of matched students academically who took more than 15 or more and who took less. And it turns out that those students who took 15 or more academically outperformed matched students who took less. They had uh, more hours at the end of a year they had a higher GPA and a higher retention. And the other thing I did was the pushback on employment is I took our student data file to the labor department and asked, could they run it and tell me who's working and how many hours? And it was a huge shock to me. Um, for incoming, the first year students, 60% did not work at all. Now you can say, well, maybe those are odd data. You can go right now to the um, National Center for Educational Statistics and look up employment patterns. And they're, they're gonna be complex. Uh, certainly when I was a community college student, I, I did work and I worked a lot, but it, um, the average incoming student, say out of high school, about half of them don't work. Now, as they get older, by seniors, only about 30% didn't work. They must have a hell of a lot of money or come, I don't know what and older students and part-time students. But it turned out there's no reason why students couldn't take 30 hours. And we had this, we've started a program, don't delay your dream, take 15. And tried to push that. And it, and it worked at first, but when we stopped pushing hard, you know, people started drifting. So we did say, okay, we're gonna go with the, sample, uh, the narrative, the sample schedule of 15 um, credits and we're going to add um, milestone courses or some campuses call them critical courses that you must take it in that term and complete it in order to graduate in either two or four years. Then um, everyone of course worries about employment. And so for every major, we went to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and other sites and listed employment opportunities and then added websites on that map, the bottom of the map on uh, 
uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, oldstar.net, lots of different, now there's a lot more sources. So the, um, a, uh, I cared a lot about that. Well, then the, some people started um, asking about, well, we've got students who are repeating these milestone courses, you know, um, what should we really, you know, how do we address it? How do we guide them? So one of the really informative things I did was um, looked at the grade distribution in the first milestone course of the major and based then looked at the success rate of those students in the second, third, and then how many graduated in there. And at the end of it, I decided that maybe we should get rid of the grade C. It, uh, it just, it, the students passed, but they really didn't have enough depth to move through comfortably. So we decided that the, uh, in most cases, it had to be a B. Although say in calculus three, a C doesn't matter because you're not gonna take another one typically. Or it doesn't matter in the last course of any sequence. The, um, then that raised the question of how many times should a student be allowed to take a course? And uh, lots of campuses, uh, we had no um, limit at first. And the problem with that is I thought it was unethical. We were taking students money for say their third repeat when we knew they had almost a zero probability of, of finishing that course. It's just wrong. So you should, um, our policy was intervene early on the, if they've registered the second time and haven't passed it, we're not gonna let them register for the third. They're gonna to have to find another path to success. Now there's software that, you know, let you do a lot of that, but it's not that hard for a good advisor to look at academic maps, a number of them and say, you know, um, maybe you, I know you wanna be in business, but maybe marketing would be better for you rather than finance. And at first I thought we would end up putting a lot of students into our catch all major called interdisciplinary social sciences. But in fact, that wasn't the case. Um, they found majors in lots and lots of different places. So um, the five areas then that I felt were important, the miles, the narrative, how to read the map, the sample schedule, the recommended minimum grade, milestone courses and employment opportunities. If you do a web search and I mean, if you, you'll get at least 50 to 100 hits. If you just put in the word academic maps or um, program courses, the problem is many of them, that you just can't read them. They use codes. They just list like ACT 2200. I mean, students, that is, maybe everyone in the department probably knows what that means, except the student. So I think that you should have the course code because a lot of registrations require it, the name of the course and the number of hours to make it as clear as possible. It's a balance between too much information to make the map cluttered versus too little where it's not valuable. So the uh, getting that information organized is really important. And if you do that search, you'll see lots of different um, approaches to it, lots of different formats. I like a you know clean format mm -hmm. that is term by term, course by course, and that does show 15 or more hours each semester under total number of courses. Now the student might not be able to do that, but we want to make sure they understand, which I certainly didn't as a student. I thought 12 hours, I was graduating two years Fine. from community college. Mm -hmm. I was shocked, you know, when I found out I couldn't graduate. I needed more courses. And I kept thinking, well, they told me I was full-time and if you go full-time, shouldn't you finish in the amount of time? Yep. But, um, I was not a well aware student, I guess the thing is. Now, see, I, I love what you're saying because to me, uh, just I think CCA, uh, when we're talking about our, our different strategies, we're really talking about how like they're, they're not, they don't exist in silos. They very much interact with each other. And I think that what you're talking about with academic maps, you just mentioned the importance of academic advisors. You mentioned 15 to finish and stay on track. You mentioned math pathways and, you know, things the, uh, uh, co-requisite support as well and, and so on and so forth. So I think that really happy that, you know, what you're talking about. Before I go to the questions from uh, the audience and please keep them coming in the Q&A um, chat, 
I just have one question. It's something that I hear um, a lot as well in some cases is uh, the potential objection that uh, maps when they're you know restrictive or like these are the courses that you need to take and so on somehow restrict exploration and choice of students so how how do you yeah i know uh, how do you uh, address that uh, that objection that it's a very very common objection and there are two answers to it first almost even the most restrictive major say engineering or business they have electives in there and you can choose uh, for instance, in general education, you could list two. I would never list more than three options, but two options for students. And you can list those by looking at the historic records of students who graduated in that major. What's the frequency distribution? I know in my own department, we decide that logic was an important course and that for the humanities general education, we would recommend a student take logic. So um, that, and the other thing is in Florida, you get penalized for excess hours. The students get hammered. Uh, in fact, once they hit 110% of the number of hours for the degree, they have to pay a 100% penalty for courses. So the legislature, when they were setting this up, uh, had a committee, which I was on, and I probably looked at, I would say realistically 2000 transcripts not in detail, but sorting them in various ways. And I concluded that the students who generated all these excess hours weren't really exploring. They were, they were lost because they didn't know the path to graduation. They were taking courses that they shouldn't have. Um, and they were often, I would say half of them were in the wrong major. They had declared a major they were never going to be successful in and they kept hammering at it and it didn't work. So if you look at the electives and you look at the options in general ed, students have plenty of opportunity to explore. I, I would mention that um, a lot of schools say if they're off the map, we're going to hold their registration. And my response, I, I did that at first and that was stupid because what happens is they miss their registration window, <laughs> all the courses are filling up and then they're stuck. So we would um, put a hold on them, but not stop them from registering. The other thing is faculty turned out to love it because they did, like in our department, we did a two year teaching schedule because we knew how many courses we were going to need, how many seats we were going to need in each of those courses. And we could look out two years and plan it so that if faculty had a sabbatical coming up or other issues, we, we could plan ahead. It was very, very positive. I think there's a lot of other positives, but those, those yes. are positive. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. So let me get to the, the question. You kind of addressed some of them. Um, the, the first one I think you mentioned, uh, one of the questions is about how do you prohibit a student from retaking a course needed for their degree? You know, what options do, they, do, you, do you provide, um, you know, for, for them to help their degree? And I think that could be one point that if you have to repeat a course are you really in the right degree? Like, you know, is, is there something that, you know, where advising can really come in? And this is where I think purpose and, and really helping the students looking at poten potentially other options rather than struggling and, and spinning your wheel without going anywhere. Um, we had a policy that if you were repeated a course twice or off map twice, didn't take the milestone course, either off the map for two terms or repeating a, a milestone course, um, you had to meet with an advisor, either your faculty advisor or your professional advisor. Now, two institutions in Florida made it one time. You know, mm. if, uh, if you were off map once, you had to change majors. I thought that was a little draconian, yeah. especially, you know, if you look at, um, I love looking at data and the 20, I think it was, not, um, 2020, the um, longitudinal transcript analysis at all students who started college in 2012, uh, how many changed majors and about half of the students changed majors by the third term. So again, I think the value, a lot of advisors have told me this um, to like, was it, you know, in 2019, before we all got locked down, 
I was meeting with some advisors and they said the, another value of maps is when the student is not sure what they're gonna do, you can lay out four or five maps and say, okay, let's look at these courses. How does that fit with your interests? And look, you can get 80% of your courses will count toward that major. Now you can do this with software. It's, mm -hmm. The truth is a advisor with any experience can do this you know, in 10 minutes, quickly. Yeah. but um, it really does help, especially when they come in. Um, we were not allowed to have undecided students in Florida. So our term was exploratory because the <laughs> legislature said everyone had to have a major. <laughs> one of our governors tried to make them have a major by 11th grade. Now, the person obviously had no experience with students, but um, <laughs> it also helps with the exploratory. You know, yeah. the students can look over, they, they don't just hear the word economics or physics or engineering or music. They can look at the suite of courses associated with that degree and get a sense, is this something that interests me that, that I want to do? And on the, there was, that's exactly one of the questions, like how do you deal with students who are undecided or exploratory? Uh, and to me, that's, the meta majors is a great option for that yeah. because so many courses in the first year in the first year and a half are so similar. So having a good advising session coming up with like, you know, information around careers and, and what are you interested in and things like that, you can really help them, if not uh, put them on a specific major, but at least in a discipline, right. know, such as social sciences that where the first year really are, are gonna be pretty much the same courses in that area. And then helping with the students decide like, are you interested more in psychology or sociology or anything else um but to me that's i think that's the way meta major is a good way of yeah. looking at it um is there anything else they can think of around for well the we had a very sophisticated way to do meta majors we had yellow stickums and we would put the academic map say all the majors in social sciences and then a, a yellow stickum for every course that was common to at least three of them and so the meta majors were really built after the major maps were built to make sure that the students had that opportunity. I'm sure, you know, more sophisticated people could work it out, but you got, um, I don't know, there's a certain satisfaction of looking at yourself and not just running a program and looking at which courses are in there. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, also we required a student, they had to go to choosing a major workshop, mm -hmm. um, mandatory until they had a major. And now, you know, like, you can buy my major or you can use my next step or oldstar.net. There's mm -hmm. lots of um, both free and, and commercial software out there that will help guide the student. And when I was an advisor, I'd say, do you like mathematics? Oh God, I hate it. We're going to take all these majors off the table now. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, but I, I love politics and public policy. Well, have you thought about political science or, criminology and criminal justice, you know, it's a whole suite of things. But its uh, it only gets, I think, my experience, which may be limited, um, it only gets difficult when the student is really floundering. I have no idea what I want to do. And you're right, there are courses you can get the student to take that are not harming them. It'll move them toward graduation. But gosh, so many campuses. and especially, I think transfer students get screwed over all the time. I was at a community college campus two years ago and was shocked to find that the local four-year campus, not too local, but would not accept some of the undergraduate lower division business courses from the community college. It's the same course, mm -hmm. the same textbook in many cases. So I would urge everyone to you know, look out for community college students and transfer students and make sure the courses they bring in are being treated as they should be and not thrown into an elective bucket, but move them toward the degree. Yeah, and I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, a good map may also have some flexibility. I mean, I think, you yes. know, unless obviously there's some courses that you have to go one and two, uh, some labs or, or whatever in some cases, but having, you know, for gen ed courses that you can swap from one term to the other or yeah. whatever. So obviously someone comes in with degrees, whether, you know, whether it's a transfer or someone with AP, IB, dual enrollment, you're able to actually modify 
the the map and still have you know the students graduate on time if not early because of those credits you know it's mostly the the milestone courses and prerequisites and, and typically there's only one milestone course a term sometimes there's two but you're right you can flip those courses you know in lots of different ways to meet the needs of the student but it's important that they know where they are and where you know what they need to do to get where their goal is mm -hmm. absolutely Another question. Um, so uh, it says advisors that are in a number of student support services need to be very much engaged with this work. Uh, what do you do when your load is up to 500 students? And Listen, I have huge sympathy first. Um, I had 150 advisees as a faculty member and you know I should apologize to every one of those students because <laughs> I don't think they got a fair shake. When I became provost, we had about common one to 500, even larger. And I would say the single best money that I ever spent in improving retention and graduation was adding advisors. And people forget about tuition collections. Tuition collection is like compound interest. Every student you retain rolls over and you've got that student then the next one. And pretty soon you're generating serious income. I think Tim Rennick at Georgia State said for every student they retain, or maybe it was two students, they can hire an academic advisor rolled out over the four years. Um, so it's real important not to forget about that tuition collection. And if you're in a position where you can, make sure that that money comes back to you, you know, to your unit, whether yeah. it's academic advising or whatever. But um, don't forget about that. It's a lot of money there. And to me, I think the maps help, even if you have like a large load, like 500 or, or you know, some community colleges may have like, you know, 1200 uh, and not just community colleges, some four years as well, where you can actually have uh, group advising, if you will, like, you know, for, for students that you know uh, are in the same majors or in the same area, uh, students who are doing well, you can have a group advising where here are the maps any questions, what are you talking about? And you spend a little bit more time with students who maybe have like dual enrollment or maybe a failed, you know, has failed a class. So now you have to repeat it and so on and so forth. But I think maps are great tools for group advising, for not having to spend as much time on the logistic aspect and the enrollment. Right. Be like, you know, you have 30 minutes with your advisor or with your student as an advisor, uh, you should spend 30 minutes talking about what classes you need to talk about, you know, or, or take the next semester. That should be the map. And if any questions and talk about like coaching and talk about like, you know, like you said, discussion about your major, is this the right major for you and so on and so forth. So I think maps are a great opportunity to really streamline in some cases the process, even when you have a large, um, large uh, advising load. Group about. advising is a, is a really good way to deal with that. And um, I found sometimes I would invite um, a, a student, an upper division student in that major to address the students, ask, you know, answer questions. I know all of you have listed biology as your major and there are a very large number of you. And statistically, you're not all gonna remain biology majors. So um, we've got a couple of students here. Why don't you ask them questions? Uh, you know, as painful as it may be, they're gonna give you candid answers. Mm -hmm. So um, group advising is one way. I just think the maps smooth and facilitate so much that otherwise would have spent looking at the catalog and trying to figure out, you know, what to do. But that's a that's a really good point about the uh, yeah. You mentioned dual enrollment. If you have a large number of students coming in with dual enrollment, you've got to work that into maps. Um, I, Florida started funding very generously dual enrollment, and there, we had to do a lot of adjustment to maps. Mm -hmm. as those students came in sometimes with 16, 18 hours. I think to me, that that's the same thing with um, if most of your students are part time. I mean, granted, I, I, I totally agree with like the, the 15 to finish, obviously, if there's but not everybody can do 15 hours, not everybody can do 12. If you know that like 75% of your population, for example, is only able to take nine hours for whatever reason, how about creating maps for nine hours? that you can again to me it's a degree plan like how can i as an institution help you graduate if you can only take nine hours and again 
to me, that's the information that you're providing the students. Like, it will not take you two hours or two years to graduate with an associate degree if you take only nine hours, only you take summer classes. But then let's talk about how long it's going to take you and what classes and so on and so forth. So I think that's where the flexibility in some cases that I saw maps. Um, I don't remember which institution, unfortunately, but it had the 15 hours per semester fall and spring mm -hmm. and then including summer. Uh, so where right. like, you know, you do 12, 12, six. Uh, so I think that helps also with the flexibility of um, a lot of the courses and things like that. At my first um, campus, about 75% of the students were adult learners and part time. And I didn't understand it then, but what I would do now is I would focus on making sure they got the milestone courses. If they were only going to take six or nine hours, make that one of them yep. and then fill in so that way. If they do, you know, get an opportunity to go full time, they're not going back and say, oh, I can't take that course. I didn't take the prerequisite. Or I didn't take that course. So I found that to be um, really helpful for part time students. One of the questions, just uh, again, that's more logistics also a bit, is that what do you mean by milestone courses? Just make sure everybody's on. Um, um, that's a course that must be taken in that particular term in order to graduate in two or four years. So you, it's not one, something you can put off. Um, and uh, biology, you know, biology 201 has to be taken the second term if you intend to graduate. Uh, now, and, and like in business, all those fixed courses, you can say um, accounting one must be taken in either the second or third term. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can either or, um, but it makes sure the student understands this isn't something they can put off and still graduate on time. Mm -hmm. uh, couple of other questions. Uh, one's like, did you receive a lot of pushback on the repeat course policy? Uh, how much did the policy increase graduation rates? What I always tried to do is never go to the faculty senate without a ton of data. Mm -hmm. And so I had for every course that there was multiple repeats on, I had the frequency distribution of what happened on the third attempt or fourth attempt or fifth attempt when they saw the information. And then um, I also looked at about five or six other schools and you know, I've picked, you know, peer schools as well as aspirational schools because we can be a little snotty or snobby as faculty members. Um, so, well, this is how they're handling it, you know, Chapel Hill or Berkeley or somewhere. Um, and uh, giving them the information and options, I didn't get much pushback after that. I got some pushback from students, who, you know, believe somehow by some miracle they were going to pass that course. Um, one question, um, do we have any idea how the students did in the job market? And for that, I, I, I think there are different ways that we can look at it. Um, one, I would strongly recommend that you look at the University of Delaware uh, website that has the information as to why students, uh, to me, it's kind of like a preamble, if you went to the academic map as to why you should be excited about this particular major, what are you going to do in the next four years? What are the jobs, like you said, associated with this? What are the titles, the job titles? Where do you work and so on and so forth? So University of Delaware has that and they include the information for their alumni. So you can see, a student can see like if I pursue a BA in psychology, what, what may happen with me? Like, you know, what, once I graduate, what are the jobs, you know, where, do, where there are jobs, how much am I gonna be paid for and so on and so forth. So uh, for that particular question, I would, uh, the um, the that. state of Florida requires every institution to report. It used to be every six months. I think last year it went to once a year. Um, the quarterly uh, first the who uh, the employment status of every student who graduated the previous year and their quarterly income. And what um, I can't remember. I'd have to go back and look at whether data they have on the site. But what I found kind of interesting is I, I went, I looked up, you know, okay, you got a degree in classics, you know, um, they were employed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and making some kind of income. I mean, the income of humanities, you know, graduates were 
considerably lower than engineering graduates. Mm -hmm. But um, they had a pretty high rate of employment. And I can't, I think that might be on the Florida Board of Governors website. I can't remember if they have the job titles or not. Um, and the, the uh, I think most of the narratives or the employment opportunities, at least on ours, we had some t job titles, you know, this is what you can do, and then links to Bureau of Labor Statistics or other similar link, what jobs are out there. And if, I don't know if it's, if it's free or not, but um, burning, burning glass or MC, mm -hmm. you can get, I mean, you can drill down by city, county, state, a mm -hmm. series of opportunities. And I think for most campuses, it's free, isn't it? I'm not sure. Well, Strata, when Strata is a nonprofit now, so I hope yeah. it's free. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, another question is about the uh, students seeking admissions to limited access programs. Like, cool. you know, uh, what do you do with that? And, and how do you, like, can you build a plan B for, for those who are unable to basically gain access to these particular uh, programs. So how, what, what would you be your, what would be your strategy? That's a great that? question because students often will register for courses that they think are very easy in order to get their GPA up to the minimum for those limited access courses. And the truth is it almost never goes well. And it's extremely important to have options. I and mean, um, Fortunately, at the national level, as well as local, you know, nursing, very high demand for nursing. Mm -hmm. But in, in a town of 250,000 and two hospitals, the, the clinical rotation sites are limited. And so you're only going to have, you only take so many majors. Mm -hmm. And so within nursing, those, especially since the first two year curriculum is often locked in, what other options are there? And now there's a whole series of majors you can find on different websites that to move from a nursing major into different aspects of healthcare without having a nursing degree. Mm -hmm. and it's very important to have that, um, that option because there's simply limited access means that not everyone's going to get in. Yeah. And for that, for not that, fair to let them try or to make them think they're going to get in. Yeah. So I think to me, like the, the student tracking and advising and career counseling, I think not let, not letting it, the outreach to students, not waiting till the, the semester where they have to apply to say like, oh, well, right. you know what, you don't have the right GPA or something. So making sure that there's a continued advising for those particular majors, uh, that's something that can help. And in some cases, it may, it may be worth their while to actually have a conversation after the first two semesters, like, you know what, that that is not in the cards, but we do have other options here, other majors that might fit your interests as well they're in the same field and, and so on and so forth uh, but really again let, let's not wait for the students to achieve like 60 hours for them to say like guess what you can't complete the other 60 hours in that particular program that to me is a uh, disservice to the students it's really important to look at your catalog carefully on those limited access when i first became provost the nursing said applicants must have a 3.2 blah 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 nobody with under a 3.6 ever yeah. got in yeah and so that is really misleading you cannot say that yeah. you've got to say you know you're going to have to have a last year a three six and you know these uh, a and physiology and anatomy and b you know it's real important like you just said don't let the student get far along yeah. i mean i actually advise students which i didn't like to do um because it hurt our statistics but another university not a state not far away, had lots of slots in nursing. And I said, if that is your heart is absolutely set on that, apply there and see if you can get into nursing. If you do, that's wonderful. We'll help you in every way we can, but it, it doesn't look like it's gonna work here. Yeah. So last question, and unfortunately we're running out of time. For those of you who are uh, have still questions, we'll give you a, uh, an email address. You know, so feel free to reach out to me and, or, or to Larry to, to have those questions answered. The last question, I think again, a lot of folks think they have maps, think they have somewhat good maps or in some cases, uh, but what is the best process to, to get started? You know, I think that you, you mentioned um, about not necessarily forming a committee and waiting for them to actually look at it, but really 
starting with something in mind for them to review, right? <laughs> um, I don't know if you still have it at, on the CCA website, but I, uh, I tried to break it down into 17 baby steps. <laughs> You know, um, you know, what, what, you know, get a draft format, you know, how you think it would be, and then open the catalog. You know, the, the great thing is all those courses have been approved by the faculty. The degree requirements have been approved by the faculty. So begin by reformatting the information in the catalog. And as I said, put the name of the course down. Just don't put a code. You know, how many hours is it? You know, you probably don't have initially a recommended minimum grade, but you know how which course must be taken and which term if you're going to graduate in two years. So, like I mentioned before, I do not believe in bringing a faculty group anything that we couldn't get at least a draft done first. So, went through, I listed English and math in the first term. Uh, I also make, make sure that it's any special conditions, limited access, is this a limited access program? Let them know up front. Um, there are lots of different things you can do, but I always got at least a draft done and then took it to the faculty and said, this is what we have reformatted out of the catalog. Did we get it right? And if so, let us know. If not, what can we do to improve it? But don't just put codes in there and or you know just put um, general education. You open to general education, and there are campuses where there are literally eight and nine hundred choices, and you can make such a mistake. For instance, if you're a business major, there are very specific courses you have to take in general ed to fulfill those requirements, and those are not the same courses that you have to take to fulfill the major say in, in one of the sciences. So by taking the wrong general education, by not giving the student that guidance, you can cost that student a semester and a heck of a lot of time and money unnecessarily. Yeah. So for those of you, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, for those of you who uh, were asking, you know, uh, and I'm a visual person, so uh, just FYI, uh, if you're looking for good examples, I think University of, you know, Florida State University, I think has pretty good maps. Right, Larry? Uh, I hope so, at least. Well, I don't uh, think they're as good as they were. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think I sent you one. Actually, if you look at the, um, you asked me to do a, a little video thing in 2018, I think. Mm -hmm. um, post, and there's a picture that. of a map that I like. Now, a lot, you know, that's my personal preference. It doesn't mean it's the right one, okay. but I think it would give, uh, give you an idea of how to start. So we can put it on next to the, uh, so on our website where we're going to post the, the, the recording of this webinar, we can link to different institutions and good maps. So including your video and uh, those. I'll send you a map too. Yep. Uh, so with this, thank you so much, Larry. Again, this is the first one. You're going to be able to see the video, the recording, if you want to uh, go back to some of the notes, uh, if you missed some of the notes or uh, something like that on our uh, same website, go to completecollege.org and you're going to be able to see the link to go to uh, CCA Live. If you have any other questions that have not been answered during the, um, the webinar, or if you have any other uh, questions after you log off, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is on, um, on the screen right now, and I can reconnect you to, uh, to Larry with this. Our next um, webinar rather is on math pathways it's on february 25th again same time thursday at uh, 3 p.m eastern so with that uh thank you so much larry thank right, you Nicholas, everybody i will send yes. you i'll send you that model map that i like and i'll send you the steps to take and you can Excellent. do it with if anyone wants them we'll, we'll put it uh below the video so if you okay. have any questions guys make sure you check back to our website to uh see what uh larry is going to send us so again, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great thank rest you, of your Nicholas. day, and, and I'll see you next day and uh, next week. Thank you for all your interest of the attendees. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone.